this is King George III. I imagine the American colonists thought of him like this. Every day the same thing. Variety. I want something different. Fix me Parson Pfeffer right away. And for good reason. The French and Indian War made England short on cash. Their solution to this problem was taxing the colonies. While no one likes new taxes, these were different. When you pay taxes, you expect something in return. England claimed they needed the money to protect the colonies from the Native Americans. But the colonists yeah, no believed they could handle not that to on their own. Anyone, but this is a transitional neighborhood. I mean, demographically speaking, you still have a lot of marginal types. And we merchants have found you really should have some round-the-clock security here. Isn't that what the police are for? They do their best, but they got their hands full. What if, God forbid, it wasn't just vandalism? What if an employee, even the manager, say, was assaulted? These taxes were about more than revenue. For the king, these taxes were just as much about control of the American colonies. For the colonists, taxes were just as much about liberty. As you may imagine, not all the colonists were on board with the king's new tax plan. Taxes like the Stamp Act required colonists to pay a tax on every piece of printed paper they use. To avoid such tariffs, smuggling became commonplace. In turn, to combat the smuggling of untaxed goods, England relied upon writs of assistance. A writ of assistance is a written order authorizing the government to do something like taking your stuff. Writs of assistance were self-authorizing. It permitted British soldiers to write their own general search warrants. Officers could enter any home, building, or ship they wished for any reason. And officers conducting a search were not responsible for any damage they caused. This method of enforcing taxes may have been just as oppressive, if not more than, the taxes themselves. Writs of assistance were one of England's most effective tools of oppression. Colonists challenged the writs of assistance in the Massachusetts courts. A group of Boston merchants hired a lawyer named James Otis, who argued these writs violated the colonists' natural rights. While Otis's challenge failed in court, it seems he won much of the public sentiment. In particular, Otis's arguments against the writs resonated with several of the founding fathers. His arguments are credited with igniting the revolutionary movement in the colonies. As England's oppression increased, so did the sentiments of Otis's arguments. Eventually, we kicked the British out and decided to make our own rules. We wrote our own constitution, created our own Bill of Rights, and we drafted our own laws all to prevent our own government from repeating the tyranny of King George. The Fourth Amendment has two parts. The first provides a reasonableness requirement. The second discusses a warrant requirement. Taken together, courts have interpreted these two clauses as requiring, when police are searching to discover evidence of a crime, reasonableness usually means getting a search warrant from a judge based upon probable cause. Obviously, there will be times when it's not reasonable to get a warrant. Tell me where the bomb is! Times when the reasonableness clause and the warrant clause don't seem to fit together. We don't have enough to get a search. Trying to reconcile the two clauses creates lots of questions. In trying to answer those questions, courts have come up with what seems like a never-ending list of exceptions to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement. While some make sense, others not as much. Over the years, the courts have even limited the use of the exclusionary rule. There's no need to imagine how our world would look without the Fourth Amendment. The American Revolution already painted that picture, showing us a cruel and arbitrary use of power. To prevent this from reoccurring, that's why we created the Fourth Amendment. However, despite our government's own history, there are still vocal opponents of the Fourth Amendment. 
phone collection program is just three votes short in the Senate. Yet chances for an agreement are looking bleak. Senator Rand Paul has said that he will force an expiration. Senator Dan Coats, member of the Intelligence Committee, joins us now before he heads. The White House has said this is a matter of national security. AVs have others. If these programs expire, and if, God forbid, there is a terrorist attack on U.S. soil in the coming weeks or months, will those who voted against this, will those who kept this extension from happening have blood on their hands? Well, there will be accountability. This belief misses the entire point. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Thomas Paine, and John Adams did not come up with a collection of rights in our Constitution to protect the guilty. This belief ignores the lessons of granting the government the unchecked power to search its people and seize their property. It ignores the Fourth Amendment was a direct response to England's writs of assistance. This belief fails to comprehend the Founders' belief that everyone has a right to be free from unreasonable government interference. And in their eyes, this right was given to everyone by God. And rights given by your Creator were not to be arbitrarily taken away. No, I've, I've always, you know, a dictatorship would be a heck of a lot easier. There's no question about it. The Fourth Amendment is our country's guarantee to its people, to a right to privacy. And in a democracy, privacy is freedom. This may be freedom from something as invasive as the government breaking down your door to search for a tax stamp on a whim, or just the freedom to tell your friend what you want for dinner without the government listening in.